I would have loved to take him. I mean, he might have managed, he's passionate, he's a good star of football with the two players, playing staff. Uh, and I know that he has his love for the first place. You know. uh, a club hug is always nice to get. Uh, but yeah, I think he, the way he worked now the last two years uh, since he came has been exceptional. Uh, but every manager is, you know, it's not like how many trophies you win and stuff like that. I hope we can win a trophy soon and one of the family. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, not bad. To who? My position, <laughs> J-O-E-O. Ah, that's you. Yeah, that's my tweet. I knew that you were going to believe me. Nice one, mate. Thank you. No problem, man. Nice. Cheers. That's why I spent out of it. So, where are you from? I'm a parent Indian, but I was born here. I played in India. Yeah, I played in India. Yeah, in Delhi. I'm Ed John. Ciao. Ciao. This is for you. For me? For you. Yeah. A little gift. Yeah. We are the United Club. I will put this on my... The United United Kingdom. So you know. Oh. Yeah, it's from our club where we are this car. Because now I have from Norway, Roma Club Norway, Roma Club Norway. Oh, yeah? Ah, nice collection. Yeah, nice. I'll take this with me. Thank you. <laughs> well, John Arnaris's new autobiography. Um, first of all, some housekeeping bits uh, to get out of the way. I want to thank Emma and Tim, obviously, for hosting the event. Um, Emma for organising it. Tim for providing this lovely venue. Uh, very apt, obviously, is John one of John Arnaris's clubs was AS Roma, and we've got I think the Roma fan club from. Uh, man who needs no introduction, as you can already tell. Um, so, I'm going to reel off some statistics here, and you can correct me if I get them wrong. I'm hoping you know better than me. Okay? So, 348 appearances for Liverpool. 31 goals. Yeah. <laughs> Over 100 appearances for Roma. In the 09-10 season, I believe you made the most appearances out of any player for Roma, yeah. 52. That's more than Totti and De Rossi for, for the Roma fans who know. John, you make two one Juventus away. Yeah, we'll get on to that. We'll I get on to that. that game. <laughs> um, 110 caps for Norway, making you the most capped Norwegian player in history. Yes. Guys, can we get a round of applause? <laughs> That, make, that must make you one of the highest scoring defenders. Defenders, yeah. Defenders, yeah. So, and then also a league title at Monaco. Um, but I want to start right from the beginning. Uh, obviously, we're here to, to celebrate the launch of John's book, um, which goes talks obviously about his whole career, but also um, goes beyond football as well and talks about some really important issues. But I want to start from the beginning. You grew up in Alison, or is that the right pronunciation? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and you made your kind of senior debut there at 16, or you, made, you got into the first team squad at a very young age. But what really comes across in the book is how hard you trained from a very young age. To give you a kind of perspective, guys, you was getting up at 5.45 in the morning before school, running, uh, getting back from school, running again, hill sprints with his mum. Um, what was the kind of motivation, what drove you to train that hard? I'll give you Thank you. Um, I think uh, because of the childhood I had, I, I was bullied when I was young. Uh, you feel at a young age you don't really know what bullying is because you think it's normal because of the age you're at, but uh, I realized things I'm doing is not normal. So I wanted to be good at something. Uh, somebody told me at quite a young age I have a quite okay left foot. Uh, so I started practicing that. I was five hours a day shooting in my own goal. 
that I made myself. Uh, I trained 21 times a week when I was 12 um, because I wanted to be good at something that people could like me for who I am and for what I'm achieving. Um, and then I have a mom who is, <laughs> with all the respect, quite crazy. Uh, she was pushing me quite hard in, in, in behind like a long hill outside the house for 300 meters down. She was standing at the top with a stopwatch and I had to sprint up and down and she took the time and it wasn't good enough to have to go down again. Uh, but yeah, I, I had an okay childhood but I was bullying. I was always picked last in school when it comes to football. Even though I was the best one, I was picked last. Even people with crushes would be uh, picked before me, so that said something. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I realized I had something special when uh, my team won 21 nil and I scored 19 of the goals. Then I realized I must have something, but that was just in the small city of you know, so I didn't, on the big perspective, I didn't know, but uh, I started training with my first team in my city when I was 15, um, and it was a big step. Uh, I even got the number 10 shirt at 15, uh, which was quite special, but uh, yeah, I always had something, I love running, that's why the title of the book was perfect, The Running Man. Uh, I used to run, uh, like you said, uh, every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, an hour before school, and also at 11 in the evening before I went to bed. And between that I had probably a football session and also three hours of shooting uh, by myself. So since I was 12 until I was 17, I trained more or less 21 times a week. And um, I think probably 16 of them was by myself uh, because I wanted to be as good as I could be. And I wasn't extremely good at school, so um, football was all I had. And uh, you know, it worked out fine by me, but uh, it's all down to hard work and that's why the book is so important to me because I think people people write autobiographies and tell stories about the dressing room. I want to be open and honest in my book and talk about things that people don't think about. Um, I want the people to get to know the real John Anarisi, not only through media, because the media can twist things and write what I want, but my book is my words and my sentence and nobody can twist, twist that uh, sentence. So uh, yeah, I want the people to get to know the backstory because even though you're a football player, it doesn't mean that you don't have struggles in life. I think we all have different struggles, and I had mine. Maybe talk a bit about, one, what it's like moving abroad at such a young age, but also how, again, uh, you had to kind of cope with adversity and people saying you couldn't do it. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I'm a person who likes to, to go against what people want me to do. I always go the opposite way. I don't like to listen to what people like, advise me to do. I go my own way, I believe in my own ability, and I love what I want to live my life the way I want to live it. Uh, so when I went to Monaco when I was 17, uh, I think the whole federation in Norway, all the coaches, uh, all the papers, everybody said that I shouldn't go uh, because I'm too young, I'm going to destroy my career, and I'm going to come back a worse player if I don't succeed. Well, that just gave me a big opportunity to go because I wanted to stop people's mouth running. Uh, so I went when I was 17, France just won the World Cup that summer, so when I came to Monaco, the first three people I met in the, on the pitch was uh, Fabien Barthez, Tresegui and Henri. And I was coming there in my trainers and tracksuit, and didn't know what, they didn't speak English. I didn't speak French, it was quite hard to discuss and talk about it, so the first six months I used to just listening. Uh, I remember my first, my first training, uh, my first game I was going to start, Sean Tigana, who was the manager, didn't speak English either, uh, came to me and said, John, yeah, tomorrow you play left, okay? I said, yeah, and then he walked away. <laughs> so I didn't know it was left back, left wing, or whatever, he just said left. So in the team meeting the morning after, I had to look, look at the board and say, where's my name, or there I am, and then he just started pointing directions where I was supposed to run. And I just had to play my own game. Um, so, it, so in the beginning, because I'm a social person, I like to have fun, I laugh a lot, I have a lot of energy. But in the first three, four, five months, it was quite hard in the dressing because I was laughing, but I didn't know what I was laughing for. <laughs> so I was trying to join in with the rest of the squad, being like funny, because I'm always one of the guys in trying to make fun. But they could roar, I knew they could just laugh at me as well. I didn't know, but I just try to be one of the, the guys. Um, but yeah, it was hard to 
But as I do with every club I go to, no matter what age I went there to, I always go to a club with respect for the, the club, the history, for the fans and the players who are there, and I want to prove myself that I'm good enough. So I won the fitness test in Monaco on my first day. Uh, I was 17. I knew I was strong and fit, but not didn't compare myself to world champions. But I won the test. Actually, the the, the, the hardest competitor I had was Claude Puel, who now trains uh, Leicester. He was the assistant manager, and he was the one I competed to win the fitness test with. He was a fitness freak. Uh, but yeah, so I, I put myself in respect on the first day, winning that fitness test. And I've done that every club I've gone to, because I want to show respect to the team I'm coming to, and I want to work hard. So it was, it was a tough start. I was uh, by myself. I, I had an apartment who was 12 square feet in the first seven months. Uh, I had a sofa bed and a little kitchen and a toilet shower in one. Um, but I just, I was 17, I just wanted to play football and, and train. So um, I learned a lot and I was so focused on making it because all these voices from Norway that you can't make it, you can't make it, just pushed me harder. So uh, yeah, I was there three years and, and I played centre midfield. By all, I couldn't do that now, but uh, I did it then, and um, I won a league title. So I think that was the first step of showing the people back home to sip it. <laughs> Didn't you break Fabian, or you fractured Fabian Bartes' hand in your first training session with one of the left left-footed cannonballs? Yeah, I wanted to put, I wanted to put myself in respect, so <laughs> I injured the, the world champion. No, um, yeah, uh, we had a shooting session and I think he saved it awkwardly or it was quite a hard shot and he, I think his, his uh, wrist got a little bit damaged but, um, um, and I couldn't even talk to him because he couldn't speak English so I just had to say hands up and then he understood so yeah, that was one of the first sessions, yeah. The hill sprints paid off then. It did, yeah. <laughs> so um, you mentioned that you won the league title at Monaco in your second season. Um, and then, obviously, your name's kind of starting to get out there in, in Europe. Um, you've been, you were over in Monaco for three years. Um, and so, I think in the book you talk about how a lot of interest kind of come from different clubs. And ironically, you're on the brink of signing for a club you'll later play for, Fulham. Um, when you're in the room with your agent, you're about to sign the contract. The deal's done. Um, he's going to Fulham and you, your agent gets a phone call. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, Sean Tigara has just taken over Fulham and he knew I wanted to go to Premier League. I was at his holiday house in France with my agent and my, obviously my mom again. She was everywhere. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the corner was done, I sat at this table. Ask my agent, is everything sorted? Yeah, you can sign this. I took the pen, put my hand on the contract when my agent's phone rang. So I, I was angry because at least but it was silent. <laughs> uh, and he took the phone, so I had to wait. And he walks back and he whispers in my head, John, we gotta go. And I said, well, I gotta sign first. I'm going, I'm going to Fulham first, I gotta sign. No, no, we gotta go. So I stood up, went to another room, spoke to him, and he said, yeah, it was Liverpool called. And he asked, they asked if I signed, and he said no. And they asked me to come there instead. So I just said to my agent, listen, you got to go into that room and tell Sean Tigana we're leaving. Because I'm not going to that room and say that we're not signing for you. So I went to the car, my agent went inside, I don't know what was said in that room. I never met Sean Tigana after, I don't want to meet him after because he's probably going to kill me. But I think everybody understands my choice when the book came calling. So uh, yeah, it was full year and uh, I signed there for uh, in 2001 instead. Uh, which was, I feel sorry for Sean Tigana because he did so much to get me to Monaco and then tried to get me to Fulham, but uh, there were so many clubs in, interested in signing me back then and I think I picked the right one. Uh, when I came to Liverpool it was, uh, like you said, I, I always see myself as a small person and not at the same level or to be mentioned in the same sense as these players you mentioned, like Gerard or Owen or Fowler. And so when I came to Liverpool I was still quite unknown. Um, People knew me for my left foot, but that's it, and, uh, and being ginger. Um, so I came into the room, and luckily everybody spoke English. That was that was good. Uh, but yeah, I didn't. I felt I'm coming from a small city in Norway, and then here I am sitting in the dressing room with these players. And so it's again about showing respect. And 
again in my first session because I heard something, someone told me that Kara and Stevie has something called the sandwich. Yeah. So the sandwich is in training when a new player comes because it's important that when a new player comes that he doesn't think that he's made it already just because he signed. So Kara and Stevie had a thing of they would, if the new player has a ball, one come from the left, one come from the right, and they smash him. <laughs> Call the sandwich. Uh, and that's just like a welcome. So I knew that was a thing before I even started. Okay, you're expecting it. But then we had a fitness test in the first training. So I thought, oh, I gotta win this one. But I didn't, I didn't know how strong they were. So we had a 45 minute running test, which means run as far as you can, as many laps you can in 45 minutes all together. So the whistle goes and I flew off and I had Robbie Fowler and people, don't worry, we'll catch him later. They never did, I just overlapped them and I won the fitness test and I escaped the sandwich because I proved I was here to work so I didn't have to do the sandwich. I see the sandwich afterwards and it's not nice. <laughs> and, uh, what was the worst? Who was the worst? Who got it worst? The worst one you've ever seen? I think El Hajid Youth got one. Uh, <laughs> he should have had one now as well. Yeah, um, yeah so it started over well, and then it's all about proving that you're good enough. And I was lucky, I scored my first game against Bayern in the Super Cup at Monaco. Then I scored a few goals you know, in my first Merced derby. So it's all about, you have to prove yourself you're good enough. Uh, and yeah, back in Norway, it was like, even in my town in Norway, in the local football pub, when I came on playing for Liverpool, people said, oh no, not this guy. And I'm thinking, my own city, with these 30,000 people living there, they support Liverpool, so when I signed, I think, oh no, not this guy coming on. Which is quite strange, um, but then again, jealousy is a powerful thing in Norway, and uh, I like to prove people wrong. And uh, the funny thing, when they go back now to my town, they all want to talk to me, hey, sh shake hands, take pictures, and have dinner with me, or lunch with me. Well, 15 years ago, they told me to fuck off. So, you know, I mean, it's weird to, to, to see it that way, but... Um, the good thing is for me, I come back to Norway now, to my, especially my city, I can walk in the street, don't have to be cocky because I know what I've done, and I know who the bullies were. And one story that is in my book is, you won't even talk about that, but he was, I was parking, when I won the Champions League, I bought a Ferrari. And I took it to Norway for the summer, uh, which I should never have done. Um, and I parked outside my street in Norway, and I saw this one guy who I recognized, and he was one of the bullies from school. And he was walking in a McDonald's suit. So I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect to walk, but because I was where I was, just won the Champions League, and he was walking to work with his McDonald's suit, I wanted to say something. I didn't do it. So he walked past me. I knew he saw me because the red Ferrari, everyone can see a red Ferrari. Down, yeah. So I thought, you know what? Nah, I gotta do it. So I walked. I walk, I turn, I go to McDonald's, I go to the counter, I make sure I go to his counter, <laughs> and I order a Big Mac. I didn't say anything, I looked at him, I said, paid, I said thank you, but I could tell mm -hmm. by the look of his eyes, he knew. He knew yeah. So I walked out, threw the McDonald's away, but didn't walk to McDonald's, but I just threw it away. <laughs> Back to my car and drove off, and it just felt like a million dollars, because I just gave him some, mm -hmm. by just looking at him, and that was like, for me it was a lot just, you're there and I'm here. So it, it was uh, a good thing. Stephen Everson, you remember Stephen Everson, the, the old Tottenham player, ex-Tottenham player. Um, I think it's quite a, a funny incident because obviously you were so conscious about keeping healthy and being a model professional in terms of how you, you kept away from the drink, but the day that that Everson gets you drunk, you have to meet the journal a journalist who doesn't like you anyway, so what about you tell that story, it's quite a good one. <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> um, no, it was after the national team game, <clears throat> I never taste alcohol, uh, and Stefan Everson, he loves alcohol, apparently, uh, so he wanted me to, because we were rooming together as well, we sat in the bar in the hotel after a win, and he said, listen, taste it. No, I don't like alcohol, it, it, tells, it tastes awful. But put it with orange, like vodka orange, because then you don't feel the alcohol. So I taste it and, wow, it's just orange juice. But what I didn't know, after three or four, he made me doubles. And I didn't feel it then. And then we went out in the town and um, 
it just, I stood up from the chair from the hotel to go to a taxi and it just hit me. What was that? <laughs> and I couldn't walk properly, I couldn't see properly, so we went to a disco and I was straight to the toilet, I was throwing up, big time. And then Stephanie Eversen comes in the toilet. Johnny, Johnny, where are you? And he's all you can help me throwing up. So he carried me to the taxi because he said, all the journalists in Norway are coming here now because somebody told them that you're drinking for the first time. So he threw me in a cab, back to the hotel, nobody saw it, but in the morning, I took a flight at 7 in the morning, which wasn't the best idea, uh, and I was, I was always throwing up on the plane, but I told the steward's lady that, no, I just had some bad food poisoning from the day before. But I had an interview the next day in Liverpool with a journalist that I know hates me. <laughs> and so he was standing inside my apartment while I was sleeping off, because I was going to train in the afternoon. And I opened the door in, uh, I hope you don't have a picture of that. <laughs> uh, so I opened the door in my own days and he could, he could tell, but he didn't write anything, but um, he knew that that was the first time I tasted alcohol and, and I've never been drunk since then. Uh, I can enjoy alcohol like with friends and stuff, but I never get drunk, I have to. When we're out, we never know what's going to happen. There's always some idiots who want to fight you or push you or be idiots, so I, I want to be in control with my emotions when I'm out because certain things can happen if not. Sure. I think life at Liverpool started very well for you. Um, the moment for the Liverpool fans here now, you, you, your first goals in the Merseyside derby. Um, again, kind of iconic Premier League goal. Um, you dribble from the halfway line or even back from the halfway line and then dribble the pitch and score. But a particular goal, again, that I want to focus on is the, your next goal you score after that is against Man United at Anfield. Uh, we're going to get it up on the screen now for anyone who hasn't seen one of the iconic goals in the Premier League era. So we'll just get a play of this video first. I've never seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, I'm surprised Bartes even tried to tried to dive for that or getting away with that after he fractured his hand already in training. But um, obviously, an unbelievable moment there. Some of the Liverpool fans just sung the song that, that came from those two goals. Um, it must have been an incredible kind of feeling to not only be accepted quickly by your teammates, but also be scoring goals of that so you instantly became a cult hero with the Liverpool fans. Yeah, I mean, um, it doesn't start better for me. I mean, I want to put myself, my name on the, on the map uh, so people can see that I'm a good player. And, but a funny story with that is that David Beckham was one of, is one of my idols. And in the morning, the day before the game, I had an interview with Norwegian papers about Beckham and how I look up to him and stuff. So in the morning of the game, Phil Thompson comes to me and says, James, you better play well today. So I said, well, I hope so too. And then he shows me the papers. So all the English papers in the back where he says, headline, Risa, I'll break Beckham's legs. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what, the, what have I said now? <laughs> and then they twisted my words from the Norwegian paper that I like to beat United and Beckham because I look up to him. And they twisted to, I'll break his legs. <laughs> so I'm thinking, oh, that's, I didn't need that pressure on me. So I made me more focus. And then when this free kick came up, uh, I actually think, I'm standing in front of it, I'm thinking, this is my moment. I said to myself, and you can see me, I'm, I'm doing something with my hands down here in, on the video, that I don't know why I'm doing that, but it's like, that's the point where I'm saying, this is my moment, I have a chance to really do something big here. Uh, and also because of it's Risa and Solskjaer as well, which was a big thing in Norway. Um, so yes, I told Dietman I want to push it a yard and a half, it, push it too far, really. I had to re judge my, my run, but when I hit it, I didn't even feel I hit it. It just, just flew off my foot. Um, so yeah, I think it, I needed to really do something in that game, just to make, don't make, look like an idiot, idiot with that headlines in the papers. I said sorry to Beckham in the tunnel before the game. Yes, no, he didn't read it, obviously, he just said no problem. But I felt I had to do that because of, it was a bad headline. Uh, but. Uh, that's a perfect game for me, especially when it comes to Norwegian fans as well, because United and Liverpool was the biggest, is the biggest teams in Norway. Um, yeah, so this, this, this goal 
football now, not just in the UK, but in football Europe, to be honest. In that game, uh, there's a Liverpool fan over there, Kevin, who is standing right behind that goal. And that's what will get you to sign this ticket later on, that's from that very game. Wow, well, well done. You the perfect view of your, of your strike, Kevin. There, My so. wife said, don't let him take that free kick. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, well, it'd be all right, and she was seven months pregnant. And when you hit it, I was celebrating with her bum going, oh my God! <laughs> Half time because he thought he was being taken off. Plans changed a bit. And Milan, Gattuso, was Gattuso celebrating or were all the Milan players celebrating? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, we were coming at half time. Uh, most of us want to go home at half time. Uh, to be honest, embarrassing. Uh, not that we played particularly bad, but I mean, you see the half time three or down and you, you have to score three goals against probably the best defensive team in, in the world at that moment. Uh, so yeah, Jimmy went to showers because he was taken off. The other sub Harry Kewell in the middle of the first half. So this was the second sub. So Jimmy went to showers. Then Steve Finner comes to Rafa and says <clears throat> he feels something. So Rafa didn't want to risk having to do the third sub straight away. So he calls Jimmy from the showers, changed again, he was coming on again, and he took Steve Finner off. Uh, yeah. Um, at half time we could see because we were to the right and the Milan players to the left in the town and you could hear Gattuso saying that, you know, they got this, they won this already and there's nothing more in the world that we want him to have played wrong. Um, so when we came out second half, at half, we thought about, okay, we need to get the first goal. Anything can happen. And we did score uh, the first goal. I, could, I looked at Gattuso straight away. He was, because he annoys me. Um, <laughs> what, what was it like playing that Milan side obviously was they were seen as the best team? It was ever. frightening. I mean, as player by player, they were, they were much, much stronger than us. Mm. But as a team, we, we were the better team. Uh, so I looked at him at 3-1. 3-2, I looked at him again and he started shouting like he always does. <laughs> screaming to everybody, shouting and blaming everybody else. Then we scored three each. At that time I knew we were going to win. Yeah. Because... Olympiacos, we need to score. Steve G scores in the last minute. Then we have Chelsea with Good Johnson missed a chance in the injury time. There's so, some signs during that tournament that we just felt, you know what, this is, this is just meant to be. But at three each, we need to step down a little bit because we didn't want to keep going and then concede the fourth goal. So, but I was sure he's going to win that time because you can't come back from three and a half time against Milan and, and, and lose again. So, um, it was a, an unbelievable uh, experience. and until the penalties. You talk about the penalties, but before that, I think you write about in your book and it's quite a personal part of your book and I was completely taken aback about when I read about it, about what happened with your agent before and obviously the aftermath and the consequences of that. But to be disrupted by something like that before what was the biggest game of your career up until then, maybe just talk very briefly about that to, to give these guys an idea. Yeah, so my agent, uh, my former agent, obviously, um, he, uh, how should I English? He tricked me. He, he stole money from me, and on the mor on the um, on the morning of the of the game, he kept calling me for three, four days, and just moaning about some. I need he, he needs to sign some papers about a mortgage or something that he needed to take in my behalf on my behalf. And that, the thing with me, I trust people that I work with. Uh, I leave them to do everything. I just want to focus on football. So I, all I do is sign the back of the papers. So on the morning he kept texting me and, and calling me, go down the reception, I fax you something, print it out, sign it, and send it back. I said, listen, I got a game tonight. I do it tomorrow when I come back from Liverpool. Fucking leave me alone. But he kept moaning and was really angry. So I said, you know what, I'll do it then. So I went down, signed the back page, sent it back, and it turned out they treated me for, for uh, almost four million pounds. So I, I lost four million pounds because of he, steal them from me and using my signatures, he faked my signatures and took a loan in my name without me knowing about it. So yeah, that was on the day of the morning of the biggest game of my career, which told me he might not be the right agent for me. <laughs> and you mentioned the penalty shootout um, in Istanbul, which obviously ended well, um, but you, you, you were one of the ones to miss your penalty. But apologies, apologies. That was the only good thing that happened at the end of that night, by the way, sorry. <laughs> Um, but it's a quite ni nice how football is kind of cyclical and obviously you then get the chance to redeem yourself in the FA Cup final against West Ham, is it a year later? 
Um, so maybe talk about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, missing the Champions League was probably one of the lowest points because I disappointed myself. Uh, I should score that. But when we did it against West Ham again, and the year after, uh, I went to... Because in, in Istanbul, Rafa just, he looked at me, he nodded, I nodded back, and he wrote me my name down. I, I thought, I guess I take a penalty then. <laughs> I guess West Ham. You, yeah. yeah. So, but the year after, I went up to this Rafa, I'm taking one. So I uh, put my name down because I wanted to, you know, get back from the miss last year. But again, I know the pressure is on, but I knew what I was going to do. I'm going to smash it uh, down the middle. Uh, and if I hit the goalkeeper, hopefully he goes in with it. I don't care. <laughs> that ball is going in the net. Um, yeah, so when I woke up there, I was sure of what I want to do, but I knew the pressure. I knew people think, oh, he missed last year. Mm. You know, he's going to miss again. If he misses again, he's going to be destroyed. Nice. But I was thinking the other way. Well, if I score, you can all go F yourself. You know what I mean? So um, I put the ball down and just smashed it on the middle, scored. And for me, it was. A victory for a team, but more personally was for myself and my self-belief in myself and that I hit back from uh, the miss I had the year before, which was... We also won that one, but still, uh, I missed my penalty and it annoys me today. led you to then start realising that the time at Liverpool was coming to an end um, and you were, gonna, you were going to leave? Well, um, I didn't see it coming. Obviously, I scored the own goal against Chelsea in the Champions League semi-final which didn't help, I think. Um, but uh, when we went out to the semi-final, uh, Rafa called my name to the office, which he normally does sometimes with different players because it was the end of the season. So I walked in, didn't have a freaking clue what I was going to talk about. I one year left my contract and he sits down and I respect the man today because he was so honest. He just said, listen, he also called me Ginge, uh, even though he's Spanish. Um, <laughs> So he goes, Ginge, I think it's time for us to go separate ways. And he just hit me like a cannon. Uh, I was like, uh, okay. Yeah, because I knew they were looking for left back. Uh, but I thought, I'll fight with him, you know, for a place. But um, I also know what they do when they sign new players. They're going to get a chance for six months and you sit on the bench. And I can't do that at that age. So he said, yeah, you've been brilliant for us and for me and everything. But I think you need a challenge and you, you need a new left back. If I knew back then it was... Dosen, I would have stayed on and fight him because he was shit. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, I mean, Dosen was a great player when it comes to Italian football, but he didn't suit the English game. So if I knew that then, then I would have stayed. But, uh, um, so I went down to the dressing room. There was two games left of the season. I had 348 games. I asked Rafa, well, can I come as a sub or something the last two games just to get 350, which means 50 games a season? Nope. He was just, no. And I respect him because he was so honest and straight with me. That's why I still speak to him today, because he's a great person and, and a friend and a manager. So I went down to the dressing room, told my teammates, I'm gone. And they said, well, gone for a day. No, no, gone, gone. Went to my car, started crying in the car, uh, because it just hit me like, Jesus, seven years I've done. So I called my agent and said, listen, told him the story, and I'm very upset, and he said, listen, Johnny, 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 give me three days. <laughs> this was the same agent as Gerard? You yes, I changed agent because this, this was uh, Steven Gerrard's agent, uh, we had the same one, and uh, he said, give me three days, there's loads of clubs wanting you, okay, I said, yeah, fine, whatever, hung up, three days after he calls, and there's a big club want me. Very nice setup, very nice setup. So, um, yeah, I think no, the really interesting part about that is again how frank you are in your book about the highs and lows of a footballer and how you just sat there in your car and kind of hit rock bottom again and then there it's kind of reminded you a number of times in your past where you've hit, hit rock bottom and that, that's really interesting how frank you are in the book. But obviously you get this new opportunity, a big club um, in Italy uh, are after you, AS Roma, I think we've got a few Roma fans in the house. Uh, like again, going into a dressing room where you've got people like Totti and De Rossi, and what were the differences between you found between Italian football and English football at that time? Well, first of all, uh, when he, my agent called me and said Rome was interested, it was like, really? Because for me, it was just to be able to play with Totti was like, 
the main reason why I went there, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I came there, signed, but it was different now because now I came to the club where I had my name already. I was like a big signing, uh, more pressure on myself. Uh, but I came there, uh, got the nickname straight away from Thunderbolt or Gladiator or El Vikingo or whatever you're gonna call it. Um, <laughs> But I came there in the restaurant and just met Totti and the Rossi straight away. The Rossi was probably the only one who spoke English a little bit. So there we go again, I have to speak this another language. Uh, still sitting there laughing about something I don't know what laughing about for another six months. But yeah, um, I love my time in Rome. I mean, you talk about the fans. Yeah, they are unbelievably passionate, but I think Roma fans are more, I mean, it's the best way possible, but more crazy. Because when you win and things go well, you're like the, the king of everything. If you lose, they can go outside, basically. then they stay in your house. <laughs> but I mean, this is different because I was lucky because Roma fans all they want is players who give 100%. And I was a player luckily who gave every game. I can miss a pass and do mistakes myself, but as long as they see I give 100%, they love you. And I think too many players don't do that. Give. And that's why the fans turn against them because they don't show the passion on the pitch that they want to fight for the team. So I was lucky. I was never in any situation with the Roma fans that was bad. I was always well liked and, and I appreciate that. But I think it comes from being who I am on the pitch. But yeah, going there to Rome uh, and the city and, and but meet the god of Rome himself, Totti, was just like I was a big player myself coming there, but I was didn't even reach his kneecap when it came to Totti <laughs> because he was different level. He was like the authority he had when he was there in the dressing room, how much the team meant to him, what he did for players. Totti was the one who always had the last word when it comes to certain things in the club. He was even bigger than the, any manager or even the president, I think, because he controls everything and uh, in a good way. So yeah, I mean, Rome was, I was extremely lucky and, and, and proud to be part of the Roma history, but there's, there's two things. There's one thing I regret with Roma is Roma Sampdoria. Uh, no, 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 no. I know. Uh, because we were in front of Inter and we lost 2 1, winning 1 0. We lost 2 1 at home. I think it was Pat Senior scored both goals and the ball goals That's came. Story with Kunsi. Yeah, and, but the, the two ball, ball goals he scored came across on the back post and he beat me in the air to score two goals. And he just annoys me because we won the league that year. Yeah, and he seemed to do this quite well when he went to new clubs. Is he scored a goal that endears you to? You thought I was going to say something else. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking what were you were going to do. So yeah, another iconic moment that endears you to the fans. Um, your first goal comes against Inter, is that right? But then the goal that a lot of Roma fans will remember you for is your winner in the 93rd or 94th last minute against Juventus in Turin. Um, the, the commentary is Carlo Zampa from, from, <laughs> from the Roma channel, so this is something quite special if you haven't seen it or heard it before. My favourite bit in a minute, my favourite bit now. Because the fans are quite passionate, you know, and you can see that it, the club means everything to some of the fans, you know. They, they, they live for the club and it's my job to give them, you know, the same back on the pitch, you know. Uh, bleed for, the, for your shirt and fight for the shirt. That's why it upsets me when I watch Roma games now. Some players who don't show that on the pitch, it annoys me because I know the fans get upset by it. So yeah, I think it's, it's important that people understand what the fans mean to the club and how important the fans are, no matter where you go, but especially in a place like Rome. I mean, if you don't show them the passion, you're never going to be accepted by the fans. And I think that's important as a player to be accepted. 
Yeah, I think as well, for anyone who's watched Roma or Liverpool games, the anthems before the game as well are two, two very iconic anthems that just kind of make your, your spine tingle when you come out onto the pitch. So as you said, you, you, you actually considered staying in Rome for, for a much longer time, um, but as was a pattern in career, you kind of decided that you needed to move on, I think both for family reasons, maybe family reasons as well, you, you moved back to London and signed for Fulham. Um, and you were at Fulham for three years, um, and Fulham was a kind of mixed time. You, you stayed up two seasons and did, and did quite well there. Um, and then in the, was it in the last season that Fulham, Fulham were relegated, it didn't go quite well. Um, but that was more to do with, I think, the management, uh, a particular style of management. Was it um, McGath that you had at the end? Maybe talk about a couple of his peculiarities before we just move on to a couple of last funny questions. Yeah, we had, uh, <clears throat> I, you know, London is an unbelievable city, you know. I don't, you can do everything here. Whatever you want to do, you can do in, in London. Uh, and Fulham is an unbelievable club. I mean, the family, you're so close together, you feel home straight away. They take care of you. This Kevin Cottage is a great stadium to play at. Uh, but unfortunately, when end of my contract, we went down. And part of that I, is because of Felix Magat as well. He was the manager. He was probably the only manager who did everything opposite to all the other managers I've been with. Uh, and when you give your captain advice for injury to go and buy some cheese at Tesco, uh, because he told Brendan Hangeland to, he told Brendan Hangeland to go to Tesco, buy a certain cheese and put on his knee in the night, he will be fit the next day. <laughs> if you do that as a manager, I think you're, you're way off. Um, but yeah, I was sad to leave Fulham as they went down, uh, luckily now they're up again and hopefully they can turn around, but uh, uh, you know, the a good generation of fans at Fulham is unbelievable. You have granddads and dads and sons and grandsons and at the same in the same game. It's just unbelievable and uh, I truly enjoy my time there and uh, I hope they can stay up now and, and with Ranieri that I know well. He's the right guy for, you, for Fulham so hopefully he can change things around. Because you played with Ranieri at Roma, obviously in that title winning, or title, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was basically a title winning season. Um, no, we, we wish you'd won it over Inter for sure. Um, but what, yeah, maybe that, that as a question, who, who is the kind of the coach that you remember in the most fond way? Or do you, do you remember them? They all, apart from Maga, have their own? <laughs> no, I think I, I, I was lucky because sometimes people ask me, can you put up your best 11? that you play with, and I have to put myself at left back because I was looking to play at every club I was to. I played every week in weekends with nobody else played. So, uh, but yeah, uh, I think I respect all managers. I think the game is something special, each one of them, but I have to give Rafa a big mention because he gave me the, the, the Champions League and the FA Cup. I mean, he was, he was, he was a little bit skinnier there than he is now. But um, yeah, he's a great person, a great friend, and an uh, unbelievable manager. And he he believed in me, he gave me the chance to play in such amazing games. Uh, and I was lifting trophy thanks to him, and that's why I'm always grateful. And uh, Rafa is a funny guy. When I speak to him on the phone now, he's always the same way he speaks to me like he did when he, he was my manager. So yeah, I gave Rafa the, the heads up there. Um, so just last couple of questions before we open it out for 15 minutes of audience questions. Um, we haven't spoken much about Norway and your time with the na international team, with the national team, um, which is strange given that you're the most capped player in the history of, of Norwegian football. Um, I think it's brilliant in your book how you say, I think when you're 13 years old, you decide you want to become Norway's greatest ever player. You fulfil that really by becoming the most capped player in Norwegian history. Yet there seems like there is a rather fractious relationship between you and the Norwegian FA. That you kind of mention how when you got your cap that broke the record for the most number of caps for Norway, the Norwegian FA asked you if you if they wanted if you wanted something kind of for them to do something for it, and you said, look, I just want a dinner with with people that I played with at Norway, and, and in the end they didn't even manage to organise that. That must be quite hard um, for you to to really just square that circle of why 
your your legacy with the national team wasn't isn't perhaps what it could have been? I think you have to understand Norwegian people. In Norway, you're not allowed to say you're good at something, or talk loud about it, or show it. And so I'm quite, I should, I'm quite outspoken. Uh, I go my own way. Always done it my whole life, and that's not always acceptable when it comes to Norwegian people, uh, certain people, and the federation. So when I when I retired from the national team. I made a letter to the FA, uh, the Federation, before I went to the press with it. And I was only 32 years old, so I could still play on, but I was just sick of it because I, I felt, didn't feel the, the, the trust from them and they supported me. So I quit and not one person, which I thought is strange, not one person in the Federation called me, texted me, or got in touch with me and asked me why I wanted to quit, or thanked me for the service, nobody. Which told me, hmm, Maybe I'm not the person they want in the team. They were happy that I'm stopping now. Because I am quite outspoken and I, I tell, I write in my, on Twitter or whatever exactly what I'm thinking. Because in my opinion, I'm allowed my opinion, doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, this is my opinion and I'm right to do it. And, but you know you're not allowed to do that. Well, I say allowed, but that's, then jealousy comes on, you know? So, yeah, well, it was hard to, to work against so many people all the time and have to prove yourself. At the end, I didn't have to prove myself because I played for Liverpool and Roma and won the Champions League and what have you done? So, but at the same time, I wanted to do it because I wanted to have the respect I deserve. So, when I got the record for most cap, they gave me a picture. And I think I played 110 games now and I got a picture. So I thought that was strange. Uh, but um, anyway, I, I know what I've done and that's the main, main thing for me that if someone doesn't like who I am and how I do things, then that's their loss, to be honest. You can keep the mics. I'm going to do some quick fire, quick fire questions, and I'll open it. No. <laughs> um, the first one: Have you met Britney Spears yet? Yes. Yes. Where? When? Ireland. Oh, brilliant! Does it live up to expectations? No, she only said hi and left. <laughs> um, that was four questions, by the way. <laughs> Have you, have you ever got Stefan Everson back for getting you drunk that time? Have you ever managed to get your own back? How can I? He's a drunk. I mean, he loves alcohol. I can't. Um, yeah, once. And this is, a, this is, this is, I, when we were rooming together, we played on the PlayStation. Tiger Woods, you played on the PlayStation. So I used to sit naked in the same bed playing PlayStation. He wasn't a fan of that, no? Fan? He hated it, but I, I just sat naked. Um, funniest or like practical joker that you've played with, funniest player? The funniest player? Yeah, that you've played with. Oh, Peter Crouch, uh, Philip Mexis. Uh, Mexis is a character, isn't he? Yeah, Dirk Kite, Carragher, um, Pepe Reina. There's so many. <laughs> and last one, I think everyone want to know here. Last how do you hit a ball so bloody hard? How is that possible? Well, if you go and stand outside your front <laughs> door and hit the ball five hours a day, you will get there as well. Um, no, I think it's all about, obviously, practice, because I used to stand three, four hours a day shooting by myself. I made my own goal outside my house. I remember having a, like a light post there. So I used to place the ball different areas to try to whip it around the, the light post, uh, different uh, length of the, the shots. I always try to hit the crossbar because that means you have to adjust your pace and stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's just three, four hours a day shooting. Uh, I decided, and this was a, something I decided, I didn't want to practice my right foot because then I lose the focus on my left foot. So I'm rather perfectionist my left foot and have a foot to walk on. But this, this foot has scored one goal. And that's the winner of Camp Nou, that's all it needs to do. And now I can may rest in peace. It's round up, babes. What is the craziest stadium you've ever been to and why? I have to say Galatasaray. Because I was there also in the thing. it was so nice. Uh, but, I mean, it's a great passion, but they scared. They are scary. Uh, I remember we have to walk out to the stadium with Police ask them to have this all this cover over because they were throwing things at us and uh, threatening to kill us and stuff. Uh, but also, uh, Napoli away as well is quite. Um, 
interesting. Is there any chance you can give us a bit of insight to what happened before Barcelona? Well, everything that's written about hitting and trying to hit, it's true, it's true. Oh, is it? Yeah, he tried to hit my shins with a golf club. I jumped on the bed, he missed, luckily. He hit me twice on the hip before I decided that if he goes again, I have to take, take him, but I didn't do it because if I was scared of my future at Liverpool. Three days, well, a few days after we both scored at Camp Nou and won the game, but uh, I can assure you we're not friends and we're going to be friends and I'm the more of a guy who can forgive and not forget. That's my view of it.